The Advanced Education in General Dentistry program is a one-year postdoctoral program that offers resident dentists advanced comprehensive clinical experience in our state-of-the-art clinic. Welcome to the Wichita State AEGD Dental Program. We are the gem of the Midwest. Now this gem is an illusion. It's not who we are. This gem is fake. It's glass. It can neither be divided and it can't be rejoined. We are malleable and moldable here in Kansas at our program, sort of like a piece of uh, Kansas flint. We come in with our edges sharp, jagged, and then we mine it, we polish it, and we mold it into an AEGD program. G also stands for gratitude. Uh, it's an acronym in GEM, sort of like Z-O-E. Uh, I'm grateful because I get to do the best job in the world. I get to be an AEGD director. I get to work with the best and the smartest. I'm also grateful for the Wichita State leadership who've given me the keys to this program. I'm also grateful for Ascension Via Christi who have embraced my program with a stipend. I'm also grateful to Delta Dental who provided the infrastructure for our building and support this program today. E stands for energy, the second letter of GEM, and I'm grateful for the mission work and the support of my Wichita District Dental Society that have been the leadership that have helped us develop the Kansas mission of mercy. From that, we springboarded into the Missouri mission of mercy last year. And then we also do a yearly event called the Medical Mission at Home, which is a local Wichita State uh, organization and partnering with uh, Via Christi, we provide dental care along with a lot of interprofessional services and education and outreach. We also, uh, a Sunday, you can find us at the Global Impact Van doing mobile dentistry. Next in our uh, acronym is M. M stands for magical and it also stands for music. When you see the organization function and work within the state of Kansas, it's magical. And although there's no music playing, you can hear the music uh, in the background as we weave and work together our competencies and our collegiality. So with, uh, with uh, continuing on, I want to welcome you to class. Uh, the cases are just a small piece uh, of what we do a small piece of the pie. We're mostly a restorative dentistry and treatment planning uh, program. We do all disciplines of dentistry. The cases we show today are cases the residents uh, ask for help on, ask for mentoring, which is our responsibility so that they have these experiences and they can go forth uh, to the small towns of Kansas or wherever their uh, journey may take them. So my name is Zach Piper. Um, I came from UNMC, uh, Nebraska, College of Dentistry, and graduated in 2019. And after this program, me and the wife and kiddos were headed up to Wasilla, Alaska to be closer to family. Um, you know, one thing I really appreciate about this program is that, you know, it's not just another D5 year of dental school. We are exposed to a lot of really great cases that I personally had no exposure to in dental school. And this case is one of such cases that was really cool to have access to. Um, this is a case that lasted over two years and three different residents got to work with this patient. A um, little bit of disclosure, the first resident that worked on this patient, uh, she didn't take any pictures that I could find. So um, I just snagged some photos from a different patient of a similar procedure so we can kind of see what was probably going down that day. Um, so health history of this patient. This patient had heart stents placed seven years ago. Patient has high cholesterol that's controlled with medication. Patient had very high dental anxiety. Uh, whenever they were doing surgeries, they treated this patient with Ativan prior to that. And even though the patient wasn't taking any anticoagulants, uh, hemostasis was hard to achieve and getting that bleeding un under control on those surgical days um, was a challenge for them. So patient came in, chief complaint was, I had all my teeth pulled a month ago and now I want implants. As you can see, we've got great quality and quantity of bone on both ridges. Uh, he was a great candidate for implants. So the treatment plan was to have four maxillary implants and implant supported overdenture, as well as four mandibular implants and a bar retained overdenture on the mandible. So these are the pictures that are not my patient, but this is just kind of showing what the implant placement was probably like. Uh, we have the guide over here. This is showing them drilling out the osteotomy. 
Um, here's them placing the implant. Uh, the only difference with this patient and my patient is here, they just did some tissue punches and then placed healing abutments on top of the implants, whereas for my patient, we did full thickness flap and did cover screws instead. Um, this is showing the post-op of the four implants being placed. Everything went great there. And then one week later, they placed the four implants on the mandible. So one thing you might notice is that um, all eight of these implants, they're pretty far sub bony. Um, the reason they decided to do that was when they took the patient at vertical rest, uh, they realized they didn't have enough space for their materials. Um, when you're doing those implant retained dentures, ideally you would like at least 12 millimeters per arch and they didn't have enough space. So what they did is they placed these implants lower to make room for that. So at this point, the next resident took over. This was three months later and they was ready to do the alveoloplasty. Um, what we did is they did the full thickness flap around and then they started removing bone until they could make it to the implant. The main uh, instruments they used were rongeurs and then a surgical handpiece. Made sure to keep everything nice and well-rounded and then just expose those implants right there and there. Um, here you can see them suturing them up, getting nice primary closure. One week later, did, they did the mandibular alveoloplasty. Same thing right there, primary, primary closure. So at this point, he was, um, you know, had kind of a tough time with those surgeries. And so he was supposed to come back sooner, but he kind of fell off the face of the earth for a little bit. He came back nine months later and said, you know, I'm ready to continue. And so what they did is they um, opened him up again and then they uncovered those implants and placed healing abutments for him and then let him heal. At that point, um, the eye came in and took over with the restorative portion with uh, after the last resident had left. So it was time to take impressions. So what we did is we did an open tray technique. Um, what we did is we used actually the uh, radiographic guide that we used in the implant planning portion. And we used some Jacobson's wax there to try and just hold some of that PBS in and make it not as messy there. And what we got there was with some implant level impressions. Now what that did is it let the lab know where the implants are in relation to his mouth. And then what the lab did is they used these to tell exactly what the cuff height is right in this area so that we knew what size of locator abutments to order. And you can see these numbers over here. This was the lab communicating with us what abutments to order. So you'll see here, this is where we were placing the abutments, uh, healing abutments. You'll see there was a lot of plaque around there. We gave the patient oral hygiene instruction that day. And then what we did is we placed those locator abutments in place. That day, once we had the locator abutments in, we put in the locator abutment impression copings and we got ourselves some abutment level impressions. What this is doing is it's letting the lab know where those abutments are in relation to the mouth. Uh, here we have our tray again that we were using for our impressions. We used all light body. When you're doing an impression like this, you wanna make sure that you're getting nice burn through here. That means you're not changing the BDO at all. And the other advantage of using this as a tray instead of just um, a custom tray is that we can have a clusal scheme for the lab to work with. Um, this is kind of similar, but a little different. Um, on the mandible, instead of using locator abutments, we have multi-unit abutments because that's what we need to get that bar in place. So multi-unit abutments were placed. Here's the impression copings. Took another impression. And here's showing the impression light body, had nice burn through here. Everything looked great there. So here we were for the wax try-in. Um, this is the bar that the lab fabricated. Um, here we've got the three locations for the clips to go in, as well as we had a breed dent attachment here on the posterior of that bar. What that breed dent attachment is doing is it's allowing some rotation to occur around with that um, denture being in place. If you didn't have that rotation there, well, if the patient will start chewing really hard on its back teeth, you're gonna have the front of that denture pop off of the bar. So that was really important to have. Um, same day we had the wax try and this is him smiling. And as you can see, he was actually biting end to end here on his front anterior teeth and he had a posterior open bite. So we took new bite records, communicated with the lab. And this was our finished result. As you can see, occlusion's looking a lot better. 
Uh, the midline was slightly off. We informed the patient, let the patient make a decision about that. He actually liked it. He said he thought it looked a little more natural, so he decided he wanted to stick with that. And so this was our finished product. This is him smiling, and this is what him finished, and he was really happy with the results. Hello everyone, my name is Cindy Vishai and I'm one of the AGD residents. I graduated from UMKC School of Dentistry and prior to that I used to live in Wichita. It has been my home since 2009 and I plan on staying here after graduation to be close to my family. I'm really glad that I completed this residency prior to working because I learned a great deal about dentistry. I want to give a big thank you to all the faculty and staff. Dr. Carnahan, Dr. May, Dr. Triani, Dr. Metzler, Dr. Evans, Dr. Mara, Dr. Wagle, and Dr. Jacobson. Thank you for everything that you do, but a special thanks goes to Dr. Elledge for making this program great. Without further ado, I would like to talk about one of the biggest cases that I've been working on here at the AGD. Here's a little bit about my patient. Um, she is a 54-year-old female with no significant medical conditions, and she does not take any medications. She is a class two skeletal with a significant curve of speed. She's a Bruxer, and she lacks keratinized gingiva on the lower left, which will become significant when we talk about her options. And here are a few pictures from the first appointment. You can see that the patient has short central incisors. She's missing some teeth on the upper left and the lower right. She does have limited vertical due to the super eruptions of those molars. And the patient was also interested in implants in order to restore her missing teeth. However, it was decided that the patient would need a full arch of crowns on the maxilla in order to gain some of her vertical dimensions and restore her implants. As I mentioned before, the patient uh, lacks keratinized gingiva on the lower right, so a soft tissue graft was completed. And here's a procedure for that. It was done with the help of Dr. May, our periodontist. A tenfold paper was used to measure the amount of tissue that was needed, and it was uh, used to outline uh, the tissue on the maxilla, which was our donor site, and then that keratinized tissue was stabilized with several stitches on the lower right. A stent was made for the maxilla to help the patient with post-operative pain. The patient came back two weeks for her post-op, and the tissue was well integrated on the lower right side, and there was still some scar tissue on the palate. However, the patient reported little, little pain in the palate because of the stent that we made. Six weeks um, after the implant on number 30 was uh, done using a surgical guide, I believe we placed a 4.3 by 8 Nobel. And I want to mention that number 30 was part of a cantilever bridge from number 28 to 29, which was sectioned off and the implant was placed. The crowns on 28 and 29 were also replaced, which I'm going to mention later in this presentation. Next, the implant on number 14 was placed, and this procedure was done with the help of Dr. Weigel because we had to do a sinus bump since the patient had limited space for the implant. However, the implant turned out great. And soon after that, the crown preparations were started. This, appointment, uh, this procedure took two appointments. I started with a front six teeth and I used a wax up to determine how much reduction I needed for the crown preps. Um, and then the same wax up was used to make the temporary restorations. Um, here you can see that I only did the six anterior teeth which were locked in place. And then I also had to build up the occlusion on the posterior teeth in order to create her new vertical stops for this patient. The patient came back for a second appointment and then all the teeth were prepped and the new temporaries were made. Patient had these temps for over two months because of the coronavirus and then she returned for her initial appointment. Um, you can see that the patient on this appointment had an anterior open bite with no guidance, so the case had to be sent back to the lab. Um, I took an impression of the crowns and I communicated to the lab one needed to change. The same impression was used to make a new set of temporaries. Here are some preoperative x-rays uh, taken prior to sending the case back to the lab in order to verify all the margins. And as you can see, all the margins were closed all around. I was really pleased with the results. 
After many um, appointments and a lot of hard work, here are the final restorations. Patient was really happy with the aesthetics. Uh, some recession was noted, especially around number five. Um, again, the patient was with temps for over two months and we did notice some recession. However, the patient has a low lip line, so she was not concerned uh, about that recession. And here are some other restorations that I worked on. As I said, number 28 and 29 were part of a cantilever bridge, which was sectioned off. And I did remake these crowns as well as restoring number 14 and number 30 with implant retained crowns. This next slide is dedicated to the domino effect that Dr. Elich talks about when restoring multiple crowns. All the crowns were fitting perfectly prior to cementation and then I cemented number 30 first and my 28 and 29 were not seating anymore. I had to do several adjustments to make sure that these restorations were seating again and I definitely learned from my mistakes in this case. And here are those final uh, restorations. You can see the uh, implant retained bridge and, uh, or crown at number 14 and number 30. Again, the patient was really happy with the aesthetics. And here is a before and after picture. A significant amount of length was added to the patient's teeth in order to create a more aesthetic smile. And the incisal edges followed uh, the lower lip line. Again, here is the final smile. I want to thank all the faculty for their knowledge. This case would not have been possible without your help, and thank you for all you do. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Dr. Diaz. A little bit of background information about me is that I was born in Cuba and I was raised in South Florida. For dental school, I went to Nova Southeastern University and I really enjoyed that experience and I would recommend it to any um, pre-dental student that I speak to. And while in school, I always wanted to learn how to do more advanced procedures like implant placements, periosurgeries, um, do more tougher wisdom teeth extraction. So I heard about um, WSU's AGD program um, through doing my own research and it was a very impressive program and it was even more astonishing when I came in and did the interview. Um, the staff and the faculty were very welcoming and it made an excellent impression. So I was very excited when I got to be a part of um, the 2019-2020 um, residents and I would like to show a little bit of all the different types of procedures and things I did during the program. So I would like to start off with um, implant placements because that was my main desire when applying for a residency program. I looked for places that allowed um, students, residents, general dentists, um, to have experience placing implants instead of having to go, you know, specialize. So when I found out that this program does exactly that, I was very excited. And, you know, I was amazed when I was able to have my first implant placed um, be site number nine. There's many places that would not allow you to do this. And it's so important because it's an aesthetic zone. That's what your priority is. And I was very excited because this was my first implant and it was a pilot um, drill and then everything else was free handed. So as you can imagine, I was very, um, how to say, nervous but excited at the same time. And a little bit of background history of this patient. Um, he had tooth number nine extracted, grafted and had an implant placed. And his previous implant um, failed due to an infection and it was removed and the site was regrafted again. So I had the opportunity um, to place his second implant on the site because he did not want to, he did not want to fix partial denture. Um, he wanted an implant and he had a, a big gingival defect and we let him know that that wasn't going to be resolved 100%, but he was okay 
with it. His main concerns were more function instead of aesthetics. Um, so I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Wagle um, that gave such amazing tips during the implant placement. And he was able to modify the patient's tissue, as you can see on the slide in front of you, so that it doesn't have that crater effect and it's a little bit more plump and, it's, and it makes um, doing the crown much more easier. So shout out to Dr. Wagle. Um, I know Zach Piper, Dr. Piper was there as well and we were both very impressed and I feel like we both learned a lot um, just listening to him explain things. So this is a before and after, you know, very luckily this patient's um, smile line is kind of right at the gingival level so he doesn't show that crater defect and you know, I'm not 100% happy with the results of the crown. I feel like the shade and the shape of the implant crown could have been better, but the patient is satisfied with it. And he, like I said, he's not um, very leaning towards aesthetics. Um, he's just leaning more to function. It's been a long journey for him, so he's just happy to, you know, have his tooth. So this next slide is another implant case, and this one's a little bit different because it involves a sinus bump. And it's just an example of an implant case which was um, very beautifully done, and I had to adapt the tissue around the healing abutment instead of having to have the patient come back for an uncovering. And the sinus bump was intentional. We decided to place the implant at the cortical bone because that is where you get the strongest um, attachment to the implant and it's been very successful. Um, the restoration is still in progress. Hopefully I'll get the case back right before I leave so that I could you know, deliver this case. It's been like a start to finish with this patient. Um, a little bit of background information with her is that she was taking um, osteoporosis medication um, and I was able to learn a lot about um, placing implants in patients that take um, bisphosphonates. And I'm very grateful for this patient. She's a lovely lady. Um, she waited a long time for me to place her implant. And, you know, she's sticking out with me even when we were coming back from the COVID-19 situation. She told me that she really wants me to to be the one to give her her implant crown. And the premolar in front of it, it's also going to be crowned. So I'm very thankful that she, you know, has this relationship with me and trust me, which is one of the greatest things that I was able to, you know, experience in this residency. You know, this is another example as well of um, some implants that I got to place. Um, the first slide you'll see is an implant bridge with a sinus bump, and I'm glad to have been able to plan and place these implants. I learned about having implants, you know, parallel to each other, and I got the opportunity to place, you know, a 10 millimeter implant on the mandibular on site number 19, and it was safe and away from the nerve. So this is things that, like, I probably would have been scared to try on my own, but with the guidance of Dr. Elledge, Dr. Wagle, um, and all the supporting faculty and staff, I was able to build confidence in myself. Um, so I also got to work personally with Dr. May, um, doing aesthetic crown lengthening and socket preservations. Um, this is a special patient in the sense that everyone knows him and they might not know him particularly, but they definitely know his smile. Um, from Abby at the front desk to all the assistants, his smile is infamous. Um, it's one of those things that you could just look at his smile when he first came in and you're kind of not looking at it for the right reasons. Um, but he's a young man and he was working at a gas station. Um, came in kind of low self-esteem, would drink Slurpees and soda all day long. So he developed a lot of um, caries at the gingiva. And this was a patient 
um, I inherited from the previous residents and we were able to just give him like a transformative smile and still work with his budget. Um, with Dr. May, we did aesthetic crown lengthening um, for his anteriors and that helped significantly in helping to restore his smile. And this has changed his self-esteem a lot. Um, he was able to apply for another job and I've learned so much with Dr. May on this case. I learned a lot just watching him um, do his surgeries. Um, one of the following examples is a socket preservation. So I learned, I watched Dr. May um, perform a couple of socket preservations. And then I had a patient sitting in my chair um, that had a fracture that extended mesial to distal. And at first I thought I could, you know, restore the tooth, but that fracture just extended all the way to the gingival line and basically the tooth was um, split in two. So I ex explained to the patient that the tooth was um, not restorable and he was okay with removing it and doing a socket preservation. And he told me that he would later, you know, he wanted to wait some time to see if he wanted the implant or if he was okay with just having the tooth removed, but he wanted to preserve that just for his future choices. Um, so I also wanna give a special thanks to Dr. May um, for letting me just watch and learn and just pick his brain on you know all things perio. And I wanna thank Dr. Code um, for seeing this patient in particular because after we did the socket preservation, um, we had to shut down our clinic and Dr. Code was very gracious to just um, simply remove the membrane for me and take pictures and radiographs. Um, you know, that's something that he takes time off his schedule just to do a simple membrane removal. So I'm very grateful for him as well. You know, next we have, um, endo and endodontic therapy has always been some like a procedure i wanted to improve on um, but at the same time i was like terrified as at trying it as well just because so many things could go wrong and that's the first thing that comes to your mind when you're doing a, an advanced procedure like this and i had the privilege of working with dr metzler on all my endodontic um treatments and Dr. Metzler, I'm so grateful for your help and your willingness to teach. Um, you are a lifesaver, literally a lifesaver. You have stepped in and saved me so, from so many endo cases. I remember uh, the first endo case that I did was a bifurcating low molar that was started previously. And we both went in there thinking it was going to be like one canal. And then, you know, it was one canal that split into two, basically. And I remember you turning and looking at me and was like, this is a 10 out of 10 in difficulty. And it's definitely your first. And it was <laughs> definitely a roller coaster of experience um, with endo. After that, I got to perform a root canal through a crown. Um, I was able to even do direct pulp capping on a young child. So you know, I would have not been able to do a lot of the endo I had done um, without your help. And I know if I had not done this residency, I probably would have referred things out much earlier on in my career. But now I'm kind of excited um, to try it. And I feel more confident all just because of your help. So I really am appreciative. You are someone that can jump in and is always willing to jump in. And then you're also telling me at the same time, no, go ahead and try, you know, and if it doesn't work out, I'm here to help you. So thank you so much. I had a great oral surgery experience and I had um, many helps um, and helpful tips from Dr. Evans, Dr. Carnahan, um, Dr. Troyani. I just want to point out um, Dr. Evans for a moment because he was able to 
teach me how to remove impacted wisdom teeth. And I was able to learn so much. He's like another um, doctor who just lets you, you know, try to do it. And if you can't do it, he's standing behind you 100% of the time and bailing you out and teaching you at the same time. He never puts you down or he never thinks any case is difficult and which for him probably nothing is difficult but it's always like such a great opportunity to work with someone as him who's very humble and such a go-getter and i was able also to work um some extraction cases um with the other professors as, as well so i want to talk about them. So I was able to do some wisdom teeth extractions um, with Dr. Carnahan, and I just want to point out that you know that molar I have circled on the left, you know, from the radiograph it had that big curve, and you know we explained to the patient that the root tip might break off and we might not be able to retrieve it, but with the help of Dr. Carnahan, that tooth came out perfectly in one whole piece and so I was very grateful for that and then that top and lateral incisor um, we ended up removing as well and it was such a weird tooth to look at um, it had like some external resorption and we grafted that site with Dr. May and that was a very tough extraction um, this is another extraction that um, I did with Dr. Evans, and it was just, it was one of the most difficult extractions I actually had to do. And I remember he was just like, just keep going, just keep going, just try. And if you know you can't take it out, I'm here to do that for you. And so I just want to thank Dr. Evans again, and I want to thank Dr. Um, Troyani. He's a great person to just pick his brain and like talk to him about radiographs and he could tell you a million ways of how things could go and what to expect. So you're never really surprised of what happens because you've always done the run through with him. So I want to give a special thanks to him as well. He's, um, I feel like him and Dr. Carnahan um, are kind of like the foundation um, to our program because they're the ones that are here the most. Um, they're the ones that I call when I'm having a difficult time um, with a patient. So thank you to them. And thank you to all the supporting staff, assistants, front desk, um, the hygiene students that come and do the hygiene and profies for us um, so that we're able to have um, open and slots to do advanced procedures and a special thanks um, to Dr. Elledge because he's the connecting thread um, throughout this whole residency and he's the person that's constantly trying to make um, our experience better and you know he, he works a lot to do that so I want to give a special um, reserve thanks to Dr. Elledge as the director of our clinic and supporting me a lot in my prosthodontic um, procedures. Thank you. So this is my graduation presentation. My name is Dr. Ranjit Ganta. Um, graduated in 2018 from Tufts University. Went straight to private practice. Um, decided that I wanted to do a little bit more. So I came to know of this open position here at Wichita State and one thing linked to another and uh, here I am getting ready to graduate. Um, little funny story, I haven't told many people this. I was at a DSO at the time um, when I applied to this program and the more I learned about it, the more I wanted to go. So it was probably a pretty stupid move back then but I actually quit my job before I got accepted. And now if Amanda, our program manager, looks back at all those emails I sent her, she'll now realize why I was pestering her week after week about my application status. So if you're wondering why I was pestering you, that's why, Amanda. So that picture on the left, that's a screenshot 
of my phone, my photo album on my phone during the first two days of clinic. I mean, those pictures and videos just show what they were doing in their last week, which is pretty impressive. Um, so right then and there, I knew this was a worthwhile use of my time. So I was very happy with the program that first week and it just, it, it pretty much stayed consistent for me. So one of the things I wanted to do when I got to the program was bread and butter dentistry. You know, that's, I, in my opinion, that's what pays the bills. You can do all this fancy stuff, but at the end of the day, people just need good old fashioned general dentistry. And we got a lot of that here. So one of my first cases was here. Previous resident did a great job extracting number eight, placed an immediate implant, and he put her in a temp. And then I made a lab made temp. And, you know, as you can tell, it wasn't perfect. And every time she came in, she reminded me that it wasn't perfect. So this is a very nerve wracking case to restore. But at the end of the day, we made a nice little Emacs crown for her and she was happy with it. I was happy with it. And, you know, I think this turned out really well. And this is one of the first restorative cases I did here. This next case, um, you know, this is, this is good old general dentistry. Dr. Troiani helped me with this one as he has with many tricky restorative nightmares. Um, she was very dental phobic, didn't want to take the tooth out. Uh, previous filling didn't really work out. So we placed a deep amalgam, let it set. Then we prepped onto the amalgam and put a PFM on there. And one thing he said that's going to stick out is you can't get decay between a metal on metal margin. So I think this is a great service for the patient. And, you know, hopefully this, as long as she maintains it, this will give her years of service. Next case, you know, we call this, I guess, a flap and fill. You know, we've all seen that deep subgingival decay on the buckle. You know, you're thinking, what do you do? Do you pack cord? Well, here we learned to lay a little mini flap and isolate. And Dr. Ellis showed us the, what he refers to as the magic minute using glass ionomer. And, you know, with the technique he's taught us, we, I am able to place a restoration that is smoother than anything you will get with a burr. That was all finished with hand instruments and it's glass smooth. And that's a technique that I will definitely be using from here on out. Next case, so this is a before picture. I really wish we had an after picture, but Dr. Nordis was kind enough to bring in his BioClear setup. Um, he brought his composite warmers, all those matrices and the instruments, and we fixed up his lower teeth, and they look, using just composite, they look just as good as the upper teeth. And I wish I had an after picture to show you, but I just couldn't get him to come in. Uh, but it inspired him so much that, you know, he wears partial dentures, upper and lower. He actually ditched the partials and he is getting implants on his upper left and lower left because of how well the lower teeth turned out. So I was really happy with that, as was he. And you know, I think that's a case that one of our residents is going to get to restore. Next patient came in like this. This is about as big a smile as I could get from him. He actually had a condition called cyclic vomiting syndrome. Um, since he was young. It's currently under control, but him and his wife wanted him to get his teeth fixed. They were just breaking down, eroded on the lingual, and you know he just wanted to be able to smile again. Well, we, we kind of did some nice crowns for him, and this is, how we, this is how we left. And this is a very fulfilling case because he was able to smile again, and um, he's happy as can be. You know, with bread and butter dentistry, you got to know how to do some extractions. Dr. Evans helped me with this case. And I remember this day well, because we did a full mouth extraction here, did a lot of bone grafting. And then my next patient, we also did the same. And I did so much socket preservation that we ran out of bone that day. We actually had to order more. So that was a, that was a really fun day. And this guy is ready to, ready to get his implants at some point. So why do I have a piece of bread with a hole in it? Well, I thought this was a fitting picture because if you're lucky, you get to do molar endo. 
And, you know, I definitely got my fair share of it. It's what I wanted to do. I graduated from school not doing a single molar endo, except on a plastic tooth. Um, but, you know, here I got enough experience to basically get a good foundation to where I can go out and challenge myself in private practice. And as you can tell here, I got really lucky because I got to do endo on a second molar. Um, and these are just some of those fun memories that I'll forever cherish. And I'm sure Dr. Metzler and Dr. Mayer can attest to that. All right. Well, in my opinion, you know, with the way things are going, I think a general dentist should be able to place these garden variety single implants. Um, you know, if it's a, I feel very confident in being able to kind of diagnose the need for an implant, plan it, and using a surgical guide, place the implant. So they say you never forget your first. So there's the first implant I ever placed right there. Um, very memorable. And what made this a really, really cool case was that I got to restore it as well, using my favorite method, a screw retained implant crown. So not only was this the first implant I placed, first implant that I placed that I got to restore. So this is something that I feel very confident in now and something that I think that we should all be able to do. So by now, I'm sure you're wondering if I just really like bread or if there's another analogy coming. So the analogy I use here is, you know, if general dentistry is your bread and butter, what happens when you add a little heat? Well, you get toast. That's the analogy I use for advanced general dentistry. So here at the AGD, we do a ton of advanced general dentistry. So these next cases are what's gonna illustrate that. So here, um, you know, one of my favorite patients, um, he, just, he just wanted some front teeth. He went to a dentist, they extracted those two teeth, he came to us and he was told he could get a bridge. So looking at those two lateral incisors on the bottom, um, they're cracked, they're worn. You know, unless you double abutted using the canines, I just don't think we would be able to get a strong enough bridge on there for him. And that's exactly what I told him. So what we did for him is we did immediate implants. So even though we took the teeth out that same day and placed immediates, we still used a guided approach. Um, you know, the way we did that is we, we took a stone model, we did a, a veloplasty on the stone model, tricked the software and thinking the teeth weren't there. And that's how we were able to plan our implants and fabricate our surgical guide. So he came in pretty recently, healed beautifully. Um, you know, the midline, little ridge deficient, but that's to be expected because no augmentation was done at the time of extraction. But he came in nicely healed. I did, uh, we did the uncovery again. He healed up really nicely. We took our impressions and the lab sent us back some custom abutments. And, you know, it's really nice when the lab can send you a seating jig. Um, just makes life so much easier. And along with the seating jig, I made you know, a little cement jig. Um, one thing about cement retained implant crowns, I just, I get paranoid about leaving cement behind. And I think this is just, just provides a little peace of mind that you're not leaving any excess cement behind. So this is how he left. He was super happy. Um, you know, he's just, he's looking forward to eating hamburgers this summer and you know, look forward to seeing him, but he is, he's happy as can be as well. Next patient presented like this. Um, previous resident did a really good job placing some implants on her lower right, but during the course of that, she started breaking more teeth. So essentially, she had no teeth for the whole lower right part of her mandible. So this is how she presented, deep implants, um, you know, two non-restorable teeth. So we had to do the uncovery. So Dr. Wagle was here to help us that day. You know, and this kind of pushed the limits of what I was comfortable with, getting that deep down. But he was kind of chair side and Dr. May was there and we were able to uncover these and extract those teeth the same day. She ended up looking like this. Doesn't look pretty, but it's, that's what healing looks like. And like the other cases, she healed really, really nicely. And we were able to get some impressions. So since she's losing the whole right side of her mandible, we did a bridge with a cantilever. Um, she's, she's a little bit older, a little bit of a weaker bite, 
So we felt comfortable doing that in a PFM. So this is how she left, you know, teeth are a little bit longer than I'd like aesthetics, you know, not, not ideal, but she was happy because she could finally, finally eat. And I tried to find a picture, but this was around Christmas time and she actually knit me a sweater because I was going away on a trip. And I wish I had a picture of that to show you, but she was, she was super sweet. Um, the last couple cases illustrate, you know, what we do here on a regular basis. We do restorative driven guided implant surgery. So the top picture is showing you an aesthetic trying. Those are teeth and wax. We nailed down the aesthetics. He was happy with that. So then we fabricated a radiographic guide that you can see on the bottom. So we took a scan of him wearing it. And then we took a scan of just the denture. We merged the two files. And that's how we were able to fabricate our surgical guide. We place the implants according to where the denture will go. And that's what's illustrated here. And this is the day of surgery. Um, he, you know, he had a lot of keratinized gingiva. So we were able to place that guide and get all four placed that day. And I actually just saw him yesterday and he's doing great. I just relieved his denture a little bit, did a little co-comfort reline and, you know, he'll be getting restored by the next resident here in a few months. And this is what we ended up with. Um, I think we did a pretty good job placing him. Last case. Um, so he's been here for a few years and he's just, he's been losing teeth. His chief complaint is he just, he can't, he just can't chew. He just wants to be able to eat steak again. Um, I know it's kind of hard to tell, but he's missing a lot of posterior molars. And a lot of those posterior molars were actually non-restorable. So that same day, I did that full mouth extraction, took out more teeth, did some more socket preservations, and got him to a point where we're ready to place some implants. So again, restorative driven. So we did a wax try-in with a lower denture to mimic where the teeth would go because the plan is to place bridges on either side. So we made our wax try-in, we fabricated our radiographic guide, did the same thing, had them scanned them with the CBCT and whatnot, and we fabricated these two surgical guides. And here's the day of implant placement for the maxilla. As Dr. May would say, we had oodles and oodles of keratinized gingiva. So we went flapless here. So for the maxima, maxilla, um, we were able to, you know, reduce his healing time. And as you know, we were seeing him actually today to place a couple more implants, but he is doing great. Same patient here for the lower. This was a little bit different because he had so much gingiva that was so thick that we actually had to reflect a flap in order to seat the surgical guide. Um, and, you know, we were able to reflect it. And one of the advantages of reflecting the guide or reflecting the flap, I'm sorry, is that you can see exactly where your implants are going to go right at the crestal level. So we were able to place them exactly where we wanted to go. And, you know, we stitched them up. And like I said, he is doing great. We'll be seeing him today to finish his lower right side. And, you know, I look forward to I think the next resident is going to have fun restoring him, and I think he's going to be happy because he's finally going to be able to eat steak again. So that's just, you know, some of the experiences I've had here at the AGD. So, you know, during all these implant placements, you know, I had the opportunity to do about 15 of them. Um, you know, my favorite saying, it's quality over quantity. So, you know, these 15 implants that I placed, I learned a ton from them. And each and every time, Dr. Ella just chair side with me, looking over my shoulder, and just, you know, I just want to thank him for mentoring me, guiding me during not only implant placement, but this whole program in general. Without him, this would not have been possible. Um, so just a special shout out to him as well. And I'm going to leave it at that. So looking back, I know the title of my presentation is why I took a $100,000 pay cut, but really it was an investment in my career. And if I were to take a year of quality CE and learning the things I learned, it would cost well over $100,000. So this was just a worthwhile investment, investment in my career, investment in myself. And I, 
I personally believe this will skyrocket the trajectory of my career and I look forward to the future. Um, you know, I came to Wichita, Kansas, not knowing anything about it. I thought I was going to come for a year and leave immediately afterwards. But, you know, as fate would have it, I just fell in love with the city. I love the people. I love the pace of life. And I actually secured a position and I look forward to practicing here. Um, not only that, I convinced my better half, my fiance, who is a pediatric dentist, to join me. So Wichita is getting two new dental professionals, and we are both very excited to be starting our careers and our lives here in the great city of Wichita. I just want to thank all the faculty, staff, co-residents for making this an absolutely great year. If I had to go back again and do it, despite COVID shutdown, I would 100% do it. So thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Taylor Truman and I am one of the residents from the 2019-2020 WSU AGD residency. I am originally from Wichita, I went to Kansas State for my undergraduate degree and then I went to Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska for dental school. This year was a little different for me because my husband and I decided that he would stay in Omaha while I did this one year residency in Wichita. The distance was tough, but this residency made all those long drives worth it. The experience that I received at the AGD program was even more than I was expecting. Here are a few things that I've been working on throughout this year. The first case that I'm going to talk about is not necessarily an advanced dentistry case, but this patient had the most impact on me this year. We all say we're in dentistry to help people, but some days you're just going through the motions. But with this patient, we'll call her JS, I felt that I was really able to enhance her life and she was so grateful after all the treatment we were able to complete. JS was one of those patients that would come in every few months for a limited exam because she was in pain. She had not been going to the dentist regularly and like most moms had put her children first and lost track of her own dental care. JS is a 42 year old female that is a type two diabetic, but is controlled with medication. Here are some radiographs showing some of the infected teeth that were eventually extracted due to the patient wishes and finances. After her last limited exam, I talked to her about coming in for a comprehensive exam to evaluate all of her teeth. Before the exam had even started, she said she was fed up with all of her dental problems and she wanted to have all of her teeth extracted. She wanted to replace her teeth with dentures. Other people in her family had dentures and now was her time to have them too. After the exam was completed, all of her remaining teeth were healthy, no signs of decay, no signs of infections, but she did need some localized scaling and root cleaning, followed by a periodontal maintenance program. I discussed different options with her and let her know that it was up to her how she'd like to move forward with her dental treatment, but if she wanted to have all of her teeth extracted, she would have to find another dentist. I was uncomfortable extracting all of her healthy teeth and let her know that I could refer her elsewhere. I think she was surprised by my answer and really appreciated my honesty. After more discussions and different treatment plan options, we decided on a periodontal treatment, two anterior crowns, and a maxillary mandibular partial. This slide shows her previous crown number eight that she referred to as Fang. She was very self-conscious about her two front teeth and wanted both of them restored with new crowns. These photos show her final crowns on eight and nine. JS was already feeling like a different person, more confident for job interviews, and was able to smile in public without worry. Here are the final photos of her with her maxillary mandibular partial and the end of our treatment together. Huge shout out to Dr. Carnahan for helping me with this case and making everything run smoothly. I couldn't have done it without you. This patient didn't need complicated surgeries or a full mouth reconstruction, but she made a huge impact on me this year. The patient was overwhelmed with joy, cried at almost every appointment. I feel like I was really able to connect with her, make a treatment plan that best suited her, and change the way she saw her dental care. 
She was truly the best patient and I hope to carry this into my next chapter. My next case is GC, a 54 year old male who was referred to our clinic for a fracture number eight. Here are some preoperative photographs that were taken before we started. Treatment plan was created, discussed, and planned with Dr. Elledge. Here are some images from the CBCT implant planning software and a PA radiograph. These photos were taken during the extraction of number eight. And these photos were taken at the end of the appointment after the implant and bone graft were both completed. These are photos from a few different stages of healing, one with the cover screw and one with the healing abutment in place. And here are the final results. I felt that the final aesthetics were beautiful and the patient was very happy with the crown. He appreciated the coordination between all the clinical photos we had taken and the lab design and that they were able to customize his crown to match his adjacent teeth. I really enjoyed working with Dr. Ellis during the planning and placement of this case. This was not my first implant case, but it was my first immediate implant and I think it turned out very well. The last thing I wanted to touch on before I wrap up my presentation is my time at the two different Missions of Mercy trips. I first was unsure how I felt about going to St. Joseph, Missouri and Dodge City, Kansas to extract teeth all day, but it ended up being one of my favorite memories from this program. Dr. Evans, you are a superhuman with superhuman strength, and I thank you for all of your lessons and all of the backup when I needed it. All the residents would take breaks, have lunch, and get back to work we would all be eating and wondering where Dr. Evans was. Well, he was still working the chairs and taking care of patients. He had more energy and stamina than all of us combined. I really appreciated those weekends and I hope it continues to be a part of the program in the future. Again, thank you to all the faculty and staff for allowing me to step out of my dental comfort zone to learn more about my field, but always being there to back me up when I needed you. That's all, thank you. So hello, my name is Dr. Hannah, and I went to dental school at UMKC School of Dentistry. I was born and raised in Colby, Kansas, and this is where my passion for dentistry got started. Uh, next year, my family and I will be moving to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for my husband to pursue his medical residency, but we do hope to return closer to home shortly after. So today, I will be sharing three cases from my time at WSU, that I found very relevant to my future as a general dentist. I would also like to thank each and every faculty member who has greatly impacted my education. Uh, this year has just been wonderful um, learning from some of the best clinicians in the country. So my first case I would like to share. I had a 57 year old male who presented with no medical history. Uh, when we took radiographs, we noticed a radiolucency above number nine. And so this patient, though he didn't have a lot of complaints, he did have some aesthetic concerns about the length of number nine, as well as how dark it was around uh, his gingiva. And so Dr. Metzler and I worked side by side on this case. Uh, we treatment planned to remove this silver point root canal, as well as section the crown um, and replace it with something hopefully more aesthetic. Um, so our first step that we did we cut off the old crown, we placed a rubber dam, and then we used an ultrasonic scaler where we uh, ditched about two millimeters around the old silver point. Um, at this point, we were able to place three files all the way around, and then we were able to spin this to the right, and it actually came out in one piece. So inside this root canal, it had a really long silver point, uh, which you'll see on the next slide. Uh, so on the far left, this is the ultrasonic scaler that we used. And so we wanted to create a little trough about two millimeters so you can see kind of how deep we went around. Uh, these were the three files that we used, Dr. Metzler and I, uh, along with the master cones. 
And so at this point, we went ahead and cleaned, irrigated, shaped the canal, uh, just like we would on a normal root canal. And then we finished the case. Uh, so this is the final completed root canal. Uh, and I would like to thank Dr. Metzler just for a wonderful year working side by side with us. I feel like I had a great experience in endodontics, thanks to you and Dr. Mayer. Uh, so just thanks again for all of your hard work. And this was kind of a fun before and after. Uh, the patient was super happy to have a tooth that was a little bit more aesthetic as well as the correct length. And so this was just a fun case that I plan on doing in general dentistry. So thanks Dr. Metzler again. Uh, so my second case involved a seven-year-old female who became our sponsored orthodontic case. She presented with severe gingival recession on number 25 along with an anterior crossbite. And so something fun about this case is all six residents got to work side by side with Dr. Hansen, who is our orthodontist at WSU uh, to treatment plan this case. And so he decided a frenuloplasty would be our first treatment goal to try to help this tissue reapproximate or reattach. And so I'd like to give a special shout out to Dr. Hansen just for his generosity with sponsoring this case and ultimately changing this young girl's life. And also, just as somebody interested in orthodontics, I feel like he's just been wonderful to work with. So thank you, Dr. Hansen. And so we started this case by doing a frenuloplasty. We did a trace incision, leaving as much keratinized tissue as possible. Uh, and then our second goal was to remove the muscle attachment, which was one of the causes for this gingival recession. So you'll kind of see as we go along, we made this incision a little bit deeper. Uh, we moved the tissue around at this point to make sure there was no attachment. Uh, and Dr. May was the lead periodontist on this case. Um, and so at this point, he wanted to place zinc oxide eugenol, which is a COPAC periodontal dressing, in order to prevent the reapproximation of the tissue. And so Dr. May, thanks for all your hard work this year. I think we would all agree that you've just been incredible uh, an incredible asset to all of our education, and you just never said no to any challenge. So thank you for being so willing to work with us. And so this is the patient after the periodontal packing was placed. So we sent her home for two weeks, um, kind of gave her strict instructions not to eat anything sticky or anything hard uh, while this tissue healed. And so this is two weeks later. You can kind of see the tissue's just starting to fill in. Yeah, so that was two weeks post-op. And then this was the after photo. And so unfortunately with COVID, we weren't able to bring the patient back in. So this is just her at her family farm uh, with spoons, which I thought was cute. But it looks like we've gained anywhere from two to four millimeters. It's hard to tell at this photo. And so we call this a success. And in the future, she may need a gingival graft, um, but we'll let Dr. Hansen decide that. And so she's gonna be our patient for the next few years. and. Hopefully you'll see her in a few years with a bright white smile and all of her teeth will be straight. So we're looking forward to that. And then our third case, I had a 61 year old male who presented with a three by two millimeter lesion on his midline of his palate. Uh, he's never presented with any pain. However, he did let us know that he had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, as well as thyroid disease. Uh, the patient was a smoker and also let us know that he had excessive sun exposure. Um, so with this kind of midline uh, lesion, you can see it right in the middle, a uh, few things came to mind. So we came up with a differential diagnosis, which included a blue nevus, a foreign body, as well as oral melanoma. And so just a little bit about each of those. Uh, blue nevus, those are just common. Those are kind of like moles that you see on your skin. And so something that is benign that we don't have to worry too much about. Um, the second thought was a foreign body, which is just any sort of metal pigmentation, uh, such as an amalgam tattoo. Uh, we kind of thought about this and just due to the placement of where this lesion was, it seemed pretty um, abnormal for it to be in the, in the palate and the patient not remember um, some sort of trauma happening. And then our third thought was it could be oral melanoma. Uh, which is most common on the hard palate, which is where this is at. It's also most common in men, as well as in their fourth to sixth generation of life. 
Uh, so this patient had a lot of factors that kind of led us towards oral melanoma, though it's very rare. Um, and so we definitely wanted to biopsy it. So after removing a few of his uh, teeth that needed to come out, we did a football size incision. Um, and Dr. Evans, our oral surgeon, he worked side by side with me on this case. And so we made a little punch around this and you can see that there was some remaining kind of black darkness up into his palate. And so this was our biopsy, which we have clean margins all the way around. Uh, so we sent that off to be biopsied at one of our local labs. And then we wanted to remove the remaining amalgam. It turned out to be amalgam, but we wanted to remove the remaining lesion um, from his palate. Uh, so we'd have everything kind of cleaned up. At this point, if we were to leave it open, the patient would experience some pretty intense pain as any lesions in the palate can be painful. So we placed a dressing over the top and then ultimately wanted to place uh, kind of a guard over that just to prevent any air, food, uh, water from touching that and making it more uncomfortable. And so the results did come back that it was an amalgam tattoo. So at some point in his life, uh, a dentist just slipped. He must have been numb. Um, and just cause some amalgam to go up into his palate, which is really not dangerous, uh, but we didn't know at the time that's what it was. So he was really happy we were able to biopsy it and get him some good results. And so lastly, I just wanna thank everybody for an incredible year. And we have some exciting news. Um, my husband and I are expecting a little baby girl in early December. So we're hoping to have another little shocker join the family sometime in the future. So thanks again for an incredible year. All right, so my name is Michael Soma. Uh, just graduated at, from Case Dental School in Cleveland, Ohio, originally from Florida, but um, decided to apply to the WSU AGD because my older sister and her husband, both are graduates of this AEGD from three years ago. I don't know. They're old. But um, so they had great things to say about this program. And when I was applying to all these programs, I really wanted to do something that focused on care for the patients and, you know, really cared about them, but also improving on dental work. And so one of the, what I hope to get from this year residency is in dental school, I learned a lot about dentistry. Um, in this upcoming year, I want to learn even more. And I also want to enjoy dentistry. I think dental school, you know, it's all about getting requirements done. But this year forward, I hope to enjoy it. It's my passion. I want to love what I do and be around, you know, the faculty, the doctors, the staff that all love it all as well. And so I heard great things about it. And I can't wait to get started. I've been without dentistry for over three months, so I want to get my feet wet again. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. This will hopefully set me up for my career um, and make me to the dentist I want to be one day. Hi, um, my name is Lucy Swisher. You can call me Dr. Lucy or Dr. Swisher. Um, the dental school I'm from is UMKC School of Dentistry in Kansas City. I just graduated and um, the reason I came to Kansas State is because back in 2010, I finished my undergrad in chemistry back in China, um, looking for doing my PhD program in chemistry. Um, so I applied the school in US and K-State gave me a full scholarship to do my PhD. Um, and so the reason I choose them, and also I like the color purple. So it's kind of important too. Um, and what I, I'm hoping to gain from AGD um, in Wichita State is um, I want to connect the dots that I learned from dental school. I feel like um, the knowledge I gain from dental school, it's, um, it's, it's separated um, and in pieces. And I hope that I can connect those dots in through my uh, studying in AGD. Um, and provide comprehensive dental treatment to my patients. Um, plus that I can um, further sharpen my clinical skills um, and learn 
lay some good solid foundation of implantology um, because I think that's probably the future direction um, of dentistry going to lead. Um, I'm looking forward to um, to begin my journey with uh, which the state. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. Thank you. Hi, this is Jason Tai, and I just graduated from the Rutgers School of Dental Medicine in the Garden State, New Jersey. Uh, my wife and I relocated to Kansas for many reasons, including quality of life, being close to home. Um, I grew up in Topeka, and of course, this program. And I'm hoping to learn a lot this year and make connections personal and professional. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Wang. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am from Boston University, uh, Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Um, I chose Wichita AEGD residency because I really think it's a very well-rounded program and I really like what it has to offer. And um, hopefully throughout the year, I will be getting better and great at aspects of dentistry such as um, cross, endo, and implants. So yeah, and I just cannot wait to get started. Hello, I'm Dr. Katie Keck. I'm coming from the University of Nebraska. Me and my fiance decided to relocate to Kansas due to the opportunities here in the family-friendly environment. I'm looking forward to starting off my career with some unique cases I haven't seen before with some faculty guidance to help me along the way. So I'm here and I'm ready to go. At this point in the program, I wanna thank the staff. The staff are the wheels in the car, the engine that keeps us going down the road, and the gas that, that drives us forward. I'd like to thank Aureli, Assistant Olivia, Aaron, Clinic Manager Stacy, Lead Assistant Kathy, and last but not least, Tanya. Hats off to you all. It's been a great year. Thank you. As their fearless leader at AEGD, I took my residence on a rock collecting expedition to find the Kansas gem that represents who we are and where we're going. Uh, in many parables, wisdom and water are synonymous. Water can shape us like wisdom. The resident must accept the shaping and it can also mold us. Um, and also certain types of rocks can be joined and then rejoined and accept polishing. Now we look for a rock that represents our mission. Now, what I initially came back with is this rock here. How could this possibly be uh, what we represent? It looks like the state of Tennessee. Let's see, the second rock we found, which is getting a little better, it's a mandible. Not bad. Actually, what we're looking for is a rock with a natural hole in it. And at graduation, we wear these around our neck to symbolize uh, where we've been, the seasons we've endured, and where we're going. The rock is a natural hole. I know you can't see that on your little iPhones. How about this? A natural hole, rounded edges, malleable. On one side is unfinished. The other side is the fusion of gold nuggets into one. So my toast to the residents is be malleable, be willing to be shaped as you go forward into possibly the fifth season. The whole represents giving. It's been my pleasure and opportunity to be with my residents. I'm inspired and I've got the best job in the world. Thank you.